uh, and I'll, I'll vacate the, the podium in a second, Vladko. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to our Oxford Martin lecture series. And uh, today, a particularly fascinating topic and also two speakers. You know the title, Hacking Nature's Computers, Exploring Quantum Computation with Organic Molecules. Um, it sounds far-reaching, frontier-like, and we're very proud to have um, Professor Vladko Vedral here today, who is not only working on the subject, is also part of a uh, Oxford Martin School supported program, and uh, with always great fascination, we are all following the work that is, is happening with him and through him and his team. Um, Vladko is a professor of theoretical quantum optics within the Department of Physics, principal investigator at CQT, the Center for Quantum Technologies at the National University of Singapore. He has published over 200 papers on quantum physics and has written two textbooks as well as a popular science book, Decoding Reality, the Universe Oz, as Quantum Information. He is known for his research on the theory of entanglement and quantum information theory. Uh, many of you probably already know Vladko, and um, we have today arranged, um, if you want, a one-two uh, lecture evening. We are also very pleased to have um, Dr. Philip Inglesand here with us, who is a research assistant in the Department of Computing Science, and who um, has been a researcher in responsible research and innovation on networked quantum IT project here at the University of Oxford. He has over 30 years of experience in the IT industry, but most recently has really focused more on the, the interface, the interaction between technology, IT, and humans uh, in the broader sense of ethics and choices also. And we have invited him to then offer also some comments and remarks and observations after uh, Professor Vladko Vedra has finished his lecture. So, Vladko, oh, sorry, I should just mention two things. Sorry, this is the kind of health and safety announcements. <laughs> Um, the hashtag for the series is o, uh, hashtag OMS Frontiers. Please be aware the lecture is being filmed and live webcast. And I was also asked to draw your attention that the next um, three events here at the school are on March 7th next week, African Futures Navigating a Profound Transition, a panel discussion with Winnie Bianyama, the Executive Director of Oxfam International, Dr. Carlos Lopez, visiting fellow here at the school. It will be at 5 o'clock, followed uh, later in the week on uh, Wednesday, 8th of March, uh, International Women's Day, a, a debate and panel here on gender equality in Oxford. How far have we come? Big question mark. Um, and then Africa's Health in Transition, Professor Kevin Marsh, next Thursday in the regular OMS uh, weekly lecture series, will be speaking about Africa's Health in Transition, again, 5 o'clock here. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours, Vladko. Thanks very much, Akim. It's uh, always a pleasure for me to speak um, at the Oxford Martin School, um, which has been extremely supportive of this work. And this is almost like a progress report uh, to you that I give every once in a while. And it's a really exciting research. I. Um, um, I've sp uh, I spoke to, with, with Jim Martin a, a lot about this, and I know he shared the same interest um, into both the technologies that come out of this, quantum computers, as well as the view that the whole universe is a kind of a quantum computer. So there is a technological as well as the fundamental side. Um, last year, I met his daughter, and she said to me, uh, one thing I want to tell you about is that uh, my mom and dad stayed up late into the night discussing and arguing about your research. And, and that's a great compliment to me. I mean, I tend to drink late into the night and think about quantum physics, but it's nice to hear that some other people also share this kind of passion for, for this. It's a really great topic. Um, I'm, I'm particularly nervous to speak today about it. Usually I'm not nervous, but I've got my children here listening to me, and they're usually my biggest critics. Uh, you know, I, I can anticipate things like, well, it was okay, you know, but uh, you said yes too many times. And, you know, only an old guy like you can find this topic interesting and things like that. Anyhow, let me try to make it as interesting as I can. So the idea with quantum computers is that technology is already forcing us uh, to look into the very small domain. 
Um, so this is Charles Babbage, you know, the first, well, he didn't make it. Uh, he had um, uh, the idea to make a, a computer, the analytical machine. I think, um, I think a copy was made um, after his blueprint and it's sitting in the Science Museum in London next to Imperial College. And you can see the dimensions, you know, it's a meter by two meters or whatever it is. But that's basically where the idea uh, comes from, to delegate quite uh, laborious calculations uh, to a machine and not to have to be done by a human being. Both Newton and Leibniz complained about it. You know, they thought this is really pointless for a human to, to write 200 pages per day of, of kind of uh, boring calculations. It would be so much nicer to dedicate your time to conceptual ideas and so on and delegate this kind of boring work. Uh, to someone else or something else. Um, of course, currently we are talking about a much smaller um, computer, if you like. So, so a chip of this size, a, a millionth of a meter, can already now do much more than, uh, than, uh, than, than Babbage's engine uh, could have done. And I think the idea with quantum computers is really to explore the ultimate limit and to encode um, bits of information into as small uh, units as, uh, as we can. Um, so it would be something like an atom for one uh, bit of information, if we can get down there. Of course, there's, there's even more room. You could, you could think about going inside the nucleus and so on. So nature tells us there's quite a lot of room that we have down there. And here is this typical picture, you know, that encapsulates the same trend, maybe, maybe as a graph rather than visually. And it's telling you how many electrons we need to encode one bit of information. And you can see that this is going down exponentially. Um, so every couple of years, we basically delete a zero. Um, so that, you know, the y-axis is, is an exponentially uh, increasing or decreasing, in this case, trend. And another way of saying the same is how many transistors you can cram into, the, into, into a single chip. Um, so these are like the basic operations inside your computer, and the more of them you can cram into it, the faster you can, you can compute. And now we are already at the, at the limit of quantum technologies. We are already really talking about a, a handful of electrons that we use to encode this information. But this encoding is by and large still classical. And the question is, can we really utilize the full potential of quantum mechanics to do that? And that's really what, what we are all about here. Um, so what, what's the idea? I'll give you the idea in a second. But what's amazing is that we can really, uh, we can actually see these um, um, atoms, for example. This is, um, this is um, ions in, a, in an ion trap, seven of them. Um, and when you shine some laser onto them, they absorb this light and then they re-emit it. So you can see them glow in the dark. Of course, the picture is amplified many, many times. This is about a millionth of a meter. That's a micron. And we are talking about much higher frequencies, um, again, a million times higher than what you are seeing here. So they oscillate really rapidly, uh, megahertz. But if you slow them down and you amplify them, you can really see them. And this is amazing to me because about 100 years ago or 120 years ago, people still, some people still doubted the existence of atoms. Um, so Boltzmann had a huge opposition in Vienna when he was doing his atomic statistical mechanics because there were people who didn't believe that atoms are real. They thought it was a nice way of calculating stuff but we don't have any direct evidence on them. And of course, now you do. So what we want to do is really use each of these as a mini processor um, and encode bits of information into that. And here is the advantage. So I think I have only a handful of slides uh, on, on quantum physics. I know that, that the audience is very mixed. I know lots of you here know much more about some of these aspects than I do. But I know that some of you may not be familiar with this. So this is the kind of stuff we teach our our undergraduates, um, uh, even in the first year. In fact, this year I'll be teaching quantum physics for the first time. So last year the director of studies came to me and said, our students find the course a bit boring. Can you go and sex it up? Um, and that's an interesting thing, actually, to be, to be told about quantum physics, because I really can't make it sexier than it is. It, it really is the coolest topic that I'm aware of. 
you know, if you ask me to present the role of rehearsals in the ancient Greek theater, for instance, then I might struggle. And you might have to sex it up. I hope I'm not offending anyone here. But, uh, but of course, with quantum physics, it really is ultimately cool. And I hope to show you some slides uh, that, uh, that really, uh, that really um, will make you think a little bit about it. So the idea is that if you use an atom, uh, you, have, uh, you have different places where the electron can orbit around the nucleus, as you know. And you can label, if the electron is close to the nucleus, you can label that as the logical state zero. And if the, if, the, if the electron is a bit further away, you can label that as a logical uh, state one. And then a guy called George Bull, um, a high school teacher in the 19th century in England, uh, said that once you have zeros and ones and you have some basic arithmetic, you can basically compute anything you want to compute, the Boolean logic. That's the, that's the heart, the core of, of any computational process. And so all you need to be able to do quantum mechanically is you need to be able to move this electron from being close to the nucleus to being further away. You have to be able to do that deterministically. I can tell you that uh, David Lucas in, in physics here holds the world record uh, for being able to do this uh, efficiently. Uh, he can do this with six nines, as we call it. Um, so he can achieve this transfer with 99.9999% accuracy. And this is really amazing. So this is, you know, this is the size of a billionth of a, of a meter. It's tiny. You can't see that, of course, but you can really control it uh, to a really high uh, degree accuracy. And the punchline here is, you know, you can now say, okay, so how's this different to the standard computer? The difference is that if you stop your laser light halfway through getting the electron from one state to the other, what quantum physics says is that it's going to be simultaneously in both of these states. And that's your superposition state. So somehow you can really make the electron exist in both of these states at the same time. And you know, as, as the, the famous American uh, physicist Richard Feynman said, this is the only mystery in quantum mechanics. How can that be? Um, so don't look at me. I don't have an answer to that. But, uh, uh, but uh, basically, as soon as we don't understand something, we physicists elevate that to a law of nature. And so I'm going to be hiding behind laws of nature. That's the way it is in this world. Okay, so that's one of the, one of the principles of quantum mechanics. The funny thing, of course, and that's what we are exploring here within this um, cluster, is how far does this principle hold? And I think most of you will be aware that the Austrian physicist Schrodinger came up with the Schrodinger's cat as a paradox, a paradoxical consequence of this. If electrons, atoms, molecules can all exist in many different states at the same time, then why not living systems? Why can't I have a cat dead and alive at the same time? And I'm going to stop here with this direction because I'll show you a slide where I will argue that this is probably OK. You can probably do that one day. But I'm just a physicist, OK? So, and cats are really very complex biological systems. And there is a big gap to bridge before we get there. Uh, but I'll show you how far we can, we can get to it. It's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so this is actually the beginning of that story. If we can use atoms. Uh, if we can use light to encode quantum information. And, and anything we've tested so far exhibits exactly the same superposition principle. It can be 0 and 1 at the same time. So the amazing thing is if I could do that with a large computer, then this computer can, can do all possible computations simultaneously because it exists in all these logical states at the same time. And that's the exponential power that you'll be getting out of this computer. And I think Jim Martin was particularly interested in this because it would, it would give you a phenomenal speed up with which you could solve um, some of the major uh, problems that we are facing these days. So I think it fits right in within the OMS uh, vision. And um, so we started asking, why not organic molecules? And I'll tell you why, why we came to this, to this idea. Actually, here is a nice shot where you can, you can see uh, emission of light. This very sharp peak, large peak, is just counting photons 
that come out of an organic molecule like this. It's just a bunch of benzene rings, if you like, carbon atoms uh, in, a very, in a very structured um, lattice. Um, and you can get emission from all sorts of other stuff that exists in this lattice, molecules of this kind, but actually you can clearly discriminate emission from a single molecule. And this is really amazing. Single molecule spectroscopy um, was last year's Nobel Prize in chemistry. Chemists are super annoyed, by the way, because the three people who got it are physicists. <laughs> the best chemists usually are physicists, by the way, but uh, so are the best mathematicians and engineers, so I'm told, okay, I don't know. Anyhow, what's interesting is, um, is, is here is just another, another picture of, of single molecules that you can see. Um, and, and so um, you can address them individually, which is very important that you know you're talking to molecule one um, at one time, then you might be able to do something with a molecule two, you might be able to do some gate between them and all of this. So it's very important to be able to resolve them uh, individually. So what occurred to us, and this actually comes from, from some evidence that comes from uh, biology and chemistry, is that maybe we could use organic molecules that are out there in nature to somehow build our com com uh, quantum computer out of these uh, building blocks. So there is evidence that nature already uses quantum computation. I mean, nature has had about four billion years to evolve uh, quantum, quantum computation, if you like. And it would be a bit unusual if, if, if there was no pressure to do something like that, if it's a clear advantage, if you can do things much faster. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of the logic of this. And it's nice because, it, you know, it's, um, it's a top-down approach. So rather than, rather than encoding information into one electron, then bringing along another electron and another electron and so on, a kind of bottom-up approach, the question here is maybe if you take a large enough molecule, there is already enough quantumness in it that it would support some kind of basic quantum computation. And maybe when you're putting these guys together, you can much, easy, much more easily get to a large scale quantum computer. That's kind of the logic of this. So it goes contrary to most of the, most of the, most of the approaches out there. Um, and so here are two pieces of evidence that we have from nature. This is always fun for me to, to talk about. Peter Hoare is sitting in the audience, and if you have any tough questions on this, I think he will, he will answer them much better than, than myself. But what was interesting is that there is, there is evidence that, that uh, animals like this, there are also other animals apparently which have similar abilities, use quantum effects, genuine superpositions of states, uh, to detect uh, the direction, in this case, the inclination of the Earth's magnetic field. So this, this little bird likes to emigrate, as you know, from the northern European uh, regions down to Africa, and then it makes the same journey back six months uh, down the line. And the question is always what kind of environmental clues is an animal like that using to make a huge, you know, this is um, um, thousands of miles long, a long journey. And of course, the first guess is it has a compass somewhere inside. And this compass is like a little magnet which aligns itself with the external magnetic field of, of, uh, of the Earth. And the experiments that, uh, that have been done in a number of places um, actually say that this is not the right explanation. So the classical compass idea doesn't work for this species, and it doesn't work for many others, actually. People have tested all sorts of, there is a turtle, I think, that swims um, from, from Singapore down to Madagascar and then way back. And apparently it has uh, similar ability to use quantum effects for that. So how did they know there are quantum effects? Um, so people, um, two researchers, uh, Wilchkos, um, in Frankfurt, in Germany, they, uh, they did some experiments on them. They actually put them, they are all animal friendly experiments and I think all of these birds survive, uh, survive the experiments. Uh, in, in fact, 
they, they survive with 100% efficiency, while, while when they naturally fly to Africa and back, some of them, of course, don't make that journey. So this is even better than nature, whatever that means. But we don't know about their psychology, of course, and all of that. So what they do is they put them into small confinements, they change the external magnetic field, and then they look in which direction the bird goes. And the bird goes in one particular direction, then scratches the wall of this confinement, and these marks that are left are used to do the analysis. And a paper a long time ago, actually, uh, demonstrated that if the, if the magnetic field, for instance, is pointing in this direction, the bird, will go, uh, the, the bird will go one way. All of these birds will go one way. But actually, what surprised them is that when you switch the north and the south for this bird, it doesn't notice that at all. It's still continues to go exactly in the same direction. Um, and why is this weird? Because if it really was a compass, then when you switch the north and south, um, you would also have to switch this compass needle, and the bird would presumably have to go the other way. In this case, it doesn't. And what they did then is they changed the inclination of the magnetic field, and, um, and they noticed that the bird now notices that. So it's all to do with the inclination of, of where you are. And then they again reverse the polarity and so on. So this was the first piece of evidence that, that there is something more going on there. And actually, what's really going on, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. What's really going on is that there are two electrons in, in, the, in the retina of this bird's eye that get quantum entangled in a superposition of state, states, different magnetic states. And this superposition of states get a, gets affected by the inclination of the Earth's magnetic field. And when these electrons are entangled, we actually know in quantum physics that they are completely insensitive to the polarity of the magnetic field. So it doesn't really make any difference whether you switch the north and south or not. This could be evolutionary, possibly also useful, because we know that the Earth's magnetic field also switches polarity every once in a while. So they wouldn't even notice that. It doesn't really make any difference. Really interesting. So it's a, we have lots of circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial because biology is complex. Uh, it's not as, as easy to control little electrons there with 99.999% efficiency. But there is lots of evidence that this is the case. And the other thing that actually prompted us to do a little bit of extra work, and that's really what I want to tell you about at the end of this, is that photosynthesis is another big direction. So magnetoreception, you know, how to measure small fields in your vicinity. You can see how useful this could be for all sorts of applications. But here is another thing that could be extremely useful, which is to do with how uh, plants capture light and convert this into chemical energy inside them. And some of these plants are extremely efficient so this is just a slightly, this, this is just to show you how complex some of these organic molecules are. But what's amazing is that despite of this size and complexity, they're still capable of executing some kind of quantum information processing. And this is a surprise to all of us in physics, because we expect quantum physics to become kind of less and less relevant the larger something is. And there are some theories out there that even say that it will break down uh, at some length scale. If an object is too big, it just won't be quantum. This guy is still quantum. Um, so there is a kind of light harvesting antenna that's part of, of, this, of, of plants or bacteria in this case. Actually, I'll show you some images in a, in a minute. They absorb light, and then they have to transfer it into the, into the reaction center which is just a part of the cell that, that basically runs the ATP cycle in chemistry that gives you energy uh, to, sustain, to sustain life in, in, in this bacterium. And this transfer from A to B is almost 100% efficient. And this is quite a, kind of remarkable because we are talking about a complex molecule that's able to transfer this with almost 100% efficiency. And classical physics, as it happens, is incapable of explaining stuff like that. We just don't have a classical model that could account how this goes to here. But if we assume that this molecule can be in a kind of superposition state, quantum mechanically, then, then you can explain this. And now, I think this is a cool part of the talk that's coming up. This is the latest work that we've been doing. 
uh, this, um, this follows um, a drunken pub debate, as it happens. Uh, talking to people over beer is extremely important in science, as you know. Um, and I think um, this was, uh, you know, as, 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 as the evening unfolds, if you have a critical mass of physicists around the table, ultimately you'll end up talking about the meaning and interpretations of quantum mechanics. And that's Schrodinger's cat. You know, can you really put a large object in a weird state, like being dead and alive or being here and there at the same time? And I was, I was speaking to, um, uh, to um, Dave Coles, who is now at Sheffield, but used to be here, uh, part of the, the Oxford Martin program as well. And, and what was interesting is that I was trying to suggest some things that we could do with these bacteria. And to my surprise, every time I suggested something, he said, oh, that's probably OK. I can do that, I think. And I was getting crazier and crazier. By 3 o'clock in the morning, I think I had totally nuts ideas, which I will tell you about. But every time I suggested something, he said, yeah, I can probably do that. You know? And that's interesting. You know, I love that spirit as well. He's a, he's a great physicist. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is this. So what he did is he literally took these photosynthetic bacteria um, put them in a very small cavity, micro cavity, this is, this is tiny in size, and injected them between two reflecting mirrors. So what happens is if you inject some light into this, it bounces back and forth between these two mirrors. It interacts with whatever is between the mirrors, and then it comes out and you can detect it. And that's kind of the, the core of this kind of experiment on spectroscopy. And so what, what we wanted to do is, we, let me show you, the, let me show you the, the physicist's kind of picture of the bacteria. It's much more simplified, of course, than what it is. Bacterium tends to absorb one wavelength of light. This is this antenna that captures light. These bacteria live about 1,000 meters below the sea level. Um, and you get roughly five photons on average per day. So they have to be pretty good at catching photons. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to survive, I suppose. So they catch the photons here. Then these photons lose energy inside the bacteria and ultimately end up in this reaction center that I was mentioning. And this is this part that's ridiculously efficient. Almost violates the second law of thermodynamics, if you think of it as an engine. It's almost perfectly efficient. And that's what's weird to us physicists as well. So what Dave did is Dave looked at this transition here. And, and what's interesting is what quantum physics predicts is that when you put a system inside the cavity, it's going to entangle itself to the light inside the cavity. And so this energy level structure will be modified because it's not just the bacterium on its own but you've got photons inside the cavity that now couple to the bacterium. So the witness of, of, of this kind of phenomenon, that you've got entanglement, if you like, between bacteria and, and light, is the fact that this level will be shifted. You will be observing a different wavelength to the one if the bacterium was just on its own and not sitting inside this kind of light-induced um, environment. And, and you can see the picture. You can see the picture of this, um, um, of this, of this bacterium here. That's the image. And, and I want to emphasize only one, one thing from this. So th these are just technical images that you don't have to worry too much about. But what happens here is that the gap that you observe here is exactly the change in the energy level structure that's induced by a single photon being inside the bacterium and outside of the bacterium at the same time. That's the weird thing. So the bacterium is literally in an entangled state with light. And the fact I'm emphasizing up there is that it's also alive. And this was the weird part of that. I think to the best of my knowledge, no one has tried to observe directly quantum mechanical effects on something that's living at the same time. And that's super cool to me. You know, Niels Bohr, one of, the, one of the founding fathers of quantum physics, even said 
you might never be able to observe any quantum effects in living systems because they're just too complex. You might have to kill them first, put them at a very low temperature, control them really well. And so he thought of quantumness as almost complementary to being alive. Either it's alive and you observe it, whatever it's doing, or if you want to know if it's quantum mechanical, you've got to kill it and then investigate it in the usual physics -y way. But the interesting thing here is that during this experiment, we know the bacterium is entangled to light, but we also know it's alive. And the way initially Dave thought, I'm going to do this by just observing whether the bacteria reproduce during this experiment. So presumably, if they reproduce, they cannot be dead, I suppose. That's one of the, one of the witnesses of being alive. But a slightly maybe easier thing to do and better is to introduce another foreign molecule, a dye molecule, that the bacterium will repel if it's alive. But as soon as it's dead, its membrane can no longer do that and the molecule goes inside. And it's a molecule you can observe through spectroscopy. So while Dave was observing the quantum mechanical entanglement in these experiments, he was also simultaneously observing that this molecule is kept outside of the bacterium. We are talking about two or three bacteria that exist under the focal point of this kind of experiment. So it's a really tiny number of bacteria uh, that, that now quantum mechanically interact with, uh, with light. And that's amazing. So a few of us, and uh, actually Tristan and Chiara are here um, in the audience, um, decided to even investigate this kind of entangled state. And exactly as I told you, either you see n quanta of light in the cavity, and that's coupled to uh, the maximum energy you can get in the cavity minus this n photons that exist outside. So the most general state is that, is that the energy of light is directly correlated, if you like, entangled is the, is the quantum word, with the energy inside the bacterium. And you really have to use a state like that, an entangled state, to, to explain this. So it's really amazing to see quantum mechanics being at work in a, in a living system. And you know, you can, even, you can even plot how entanglement changes and so on. I don't want to, I don't want to bore you too much with technicalities. Um, I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost going to be wrapping up. Just one interesting, one interesting thought. I mentioned Schrodinger's cat being dead and alive. You can shift the relevant frequency of the bacterium inside the cavity to the point when it can no longer absorb light in which case it cannot do photosynthesis, in which case it's dead. But quantum mechanically, with these kind of experiments, you can shift the energy level and not shift it at the same time. And that's kind of the wild idea here. Can I have a dead and alive bacterium by somehow shifting simultaneously and not shifting this energy level? This would be kind of how you would try to approach Schrodinger's cat. Of course, it would be a much smaller system, but it would be amazing if this bacterium can be dead and alive at the same time. And then, you know, the typical interference would be to take a living bacterium, make it dead and alive, and then bring it back into being alive. So that's what sounds weird, you know? I have to take half of the dead bacterium and bring it back uh, to life. So a colleague of mine calls this the Lazarus operator, you know, the thing that would, that would do that. And, and you, you can imagine this is really hard, but not impossible in principle. You know, these are the kind of things you have to be doing. So here is what Tristan um, is, is planning to do sometime soon. Um, we are using much simpler organic molecules. The first ones I was showing you, the benzene rings. And we want to put them in, a, in, in two cavities like that, separate them by a certain distance, and then use a beam of light um, up there. So this is the beam of light that comes from a laser. Use this beam of light uh, basically that go, takes the upper and the lower part and entangle these two bacteria. So when one is excited, the other one is de-excited and vice versa. So that's the kind of stuff we want to be doing. And if you can create entanglement of that kind, this could also be your basic building block um, for a quantum computer. So the same picture but with, with a more complex system, a virus or a bacteria. 
And then what's interesting is that, is that um, Jason Smith in the materials department here, who is also a collaborator, uh, can actually make these tiny cavities in a huge array, something like 20 by 20 cavities. So you could imagine a huge array of cavities, each holding an organic molecule or a bacterium, shine one, one uh, beam of light and try to create a huge entangled state at the same time. And this is something that we call the cluster state. And, and we know it can be used for, for any universal quantum computation. So there are many things you could do with, with these molecules. And now the last bit of this, what, what you want to do, I, I'm just going to show you these images because they're amazing. So this is a microchip onto which we'd like to actually put these kind of molecules. Um, so what happens here is that you can inject one photon in each of these arms. And then they race down this track. This is like the hot wheels. It's just that we've got the, the fastest hot wheels in town now. I mean, this is amazing, OK? So photons, as you know, go down at the speed of light. They take these curves and so on, and all the way down. So in fact, each of these units is a separate quantum mechanical gate. This is an image of a real chip. This is not science fiction. And so you can do quite a lot of these gates and operations um, on, a, on, a, on a tiny chip, actually. Um, and then at the output, you can measure the state of these, of these photons as they come out. And I think what's of, of real interest to us um, is to try to do some, some very, very simple at this level quantum computation, where we may even insert the molecule here to generate the photons. Then we interact them with, through all of these gate elements and, and try to get um, quantum computers in that way. And it's really, it's really an interesting idea as well. So I think this is just another image of, um, um, of, of what this looks like in real life, these uh, waveguides inside, um, inside this chip. OK, um, the, the last point I really want to make is that something I haven't emphasized uh, at all, but I think it's, um, it's also along the, 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 the vision of, of the Oxford Martin School. And this is something you kind of get for free if you can control nature in this way. So a big issue for us is simply the heat generated by all the computers. And by virtue of quantum physics being fully reversible, so that means it's frictionless. If you can really do things efficiently in quantum physics, you would get computation that actually expands, wastes no heat and no energy. And, and, and so this would be even making it a little bit quantum mechanical and going into a hybrid system, I think, would help us, would help us a lot with environmental issues of this kind. So I'm just going to uh, flip this slide in front of you that you know, this research really uh, generates, I think, many interesting questions. Um, uh, it's, it's on the borderline of micro and macro. We can control micro world very well quantum mechanically. We don't quite understand how the macro world emerges out of that and whether it's fully connected, whether it can be fully quantum mechanical and so on. So things people are asking is why and how do biological systems really use quantum technologies? Can we, use, can we learn that from them? Uh, the, why, the how question is obvious. You know, what exactly is the mechanism? The why question is a question that you always get asked by an evolutionary biologist. Because for them, the point is, is increasing your, um, your um, reproductive success rate, I suppose, the number of off offspring or whatever they talk about. And it's not entirely obvious that quantum mechanics would somehow help in any direct way. For us, of course, the exciting question is, can we build on that to really make a universal computer? Can we take some of these elements that are out there for free? And, um, and, and, and make our technologies. And then something I find absolutely fascinating, which, which could be one of the principles in our universe, um, and, and I don't know what to make of it. I just find it cool, which is why I, I wrote it down, is can any sufficiently complex piece of matter uh, be actually made into a universal quantum computer? You know, can I take this glass and can I put it under right conditions and program it in the right way in order to get quantum computation out of that. And, and I think it's a big open question. It really sounds fascinating that almost anything 
could ultimately become a universal quantum computer. So I'm going to stop here. And I think Philip will explore the side of uh, human uh, technology interaction that we normally don't think about. And I'm hoping that this will lead to some interesting discussion and debate. Thank you very much for your attention. Turn my cell phone. I've moved, yeah, okay, I've, I've just, yeah, okay, good. Just being turned on. I mean, it's your... No lights on, but, uh, yeah, we off? Okay, good. Right, well, wow, what, oh, that was a fascinating talk and a fascinating act to follow. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to live quite up to uh, the promises. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Flatco, for that fascinating talk and to Achim and the Oxford Martin School uh, for the invitation to speak to you. Um, and um, as, uh, as you'll have heard, I'm, uh, I'm researching in, uh, in, the, in, in Marina Jurotka's Human Centre Computing Group here in uh, Computer Science in, in Oxford. Um, and I've been researching, I do have, actually have a technical background, um, but I've been researching into um, what happens when humans meet technology for about oh, over 10 years now. Uh, mostly computer technologies, um, but also now uh, uh, quantum technologies. Um, so I'm actually going to come right uh, completely to the other end, if you like, uh, to something which the UK government has been doing to turn some of these fantastic ideas, which are theoretical in the lab, really exciting, really forward-looking, um, and turn them into um, uh, some actual technology and some actual uh, products in the marketplace. And they've launched a, a five-year program called the UK Quantum Technologies Program. And uh, my research is part of this. It's part of a, what's called a hub in the Network Quantum Information Technologies, or NKIT. Um, and um, it's five years, and it's uh, very exciting for us because those of us who... Oops, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, so those of, us who, um, those of us who research into the interface between science and technology uh, are often used to thinking about uh, technology which is either, either science or it's out in the marketplace and thinking about the, the routes from one to the other. Uh, in this program, we are able to see uh, a range of emerging technologies uh, going from the science in the laboratory right out there um, in, in a very short space of time. I have to say that quantum computing probably won't be right out there in five years' time, although we do hope to have something working within five years. Um, but, uh, but some of the other technologies actually will be, and I'll talk about those in a minute. OK, so um, I'll talk first of all about quantum computing, uh, because that's where I've been uh, starting my research. Um, and I think the first point to make about quantum computing is that it's actually still very uncertain. Uh, so if you ask me, when will we have a quantum computer? Well, it depends on what you mean by a quantum com computer. Um, we don't know. Um, we don't know exactly what architecture we use to be build, built on. Um, there's quite a number of different, um, different uh, 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 techniques which might be used. Maybe it will be built, built using some of these uh, in, in things in nature, which uh, Blackco has been talking about. Um, at one time, it even looked uncertain that quantum computers could be done at all. There's been a number of, of naysayers said, no, we can prove you can't make a quantum computer. It's impossible. Uh, we're much more confident, actually, you can make a quantum computer. But, you know, we don't yet know exactly when, and we don't know exactly what form it will take. But one thing we, we can be fairly sure of is that we exist alongside existing computers. So you're not going to probably find a quantum computer on your desk. You're not going to get rid of your laptop and, or your, your smartphone and replace it with a quantum computer. Um, much more likely that you'll be working, uh, quantum computers will be doing some quite specific things um, and uh, the things which co existing computers do very well, um, we'll, we'll carry on doing them. And that's because it's actually very difficult and currently very expensive to make a quantum computer. Or in fact, nobody's actually made a complete quantum computer. Um, but even when they do, it's still going to be very big and very expensive. So why get them to do something which existing computers uh, already do 
extremely well. They will uh, come into their own when it comes to some specific things which existing computers are extremely challenged in doing. Um, and I haven't got time to go into great detail in any of these, but first of all, let's think about optimization, which might sound like, um, well, we can see how optimization could be really useful in things like the financial marketplace or in designing buildings or lots of different ways. But actually, it turns out that there's lots of other uh, things which can be turned into optimization type issues. Um, so if you can turn your, 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 the thing you're trying to do into an optimization problem, then probably quantum computing will be able to do things which currently existing computers simply can't do. Uh, machine learning, uh, if you, every time you, you use uh, Google, every time you uh, YouTube or Amazon or something gives you a recommendation, there's some machine learning behind that. Um, and there's lots and lots of applications of machine learning. It's become, becoming extremely important. Perhaps it's going to take away a lot of our jobs. Um, the, the, the Babbage machine engine, I think that was really useful, uh, doing, doing some of the things that actually are quite uh, boring and quite laborious. Machine learning, very likely be good to do, for doing a lot of things like that. Um, but there are limits to what machine learning can do on a classical computer. When you get to large amounts of data, you rapidly reach the limit of what can actually be calculated. You know, even if you had all the atoms in the universe and all the time in the universe, you couldn't do it using, classic, using existing computing methods. Probably you can do a lot of these using uh, quantum computing methods. Uh, but I said there's also some other technologies, and I'm really going to just stick to the technologies which are in this uh, UK quantum technologies program and the, and the hubs funded as part of that. Um, but as Vlatko was saying, there's actually lots of other potential technologies that could have uh, quantum, uh, quantum effects. Um, so first up, there's, there's quantum sensors. And um, they're, they're being uh, researched at the hub in Birmingham. And um, a good example of a kind of quantum sensor is uh, a gravity sensor. So um, at the moment, uh, if you want to find things under the ground, uh, you either dig or you use a map. Um, but if you have a really, 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 really sensitive gravity sensor, you could actually uh, detect the very small differences in, in gravity that there are caused by, you know, for example, a utility or a, a sinkhole or something underneath the ground. Um, and this is actually real. This is really happening now. They really have made some of these things, although they're still, I think, I guess, a kind of pr prototype stage. Um, and uh, kind of related to that, it's maybe not obvious why it's related, but it's related because gravity is a force, right? And so it's measuring accel acceleration effectively. So you could also measure acceleration um, in, in the horizontal plane uh, to do a form of navigation. Um, and again, this is actually being used really right now in places where you can't use GPS or where you can get much more accurately than GPS. Uh, so for example, um, it's being used by, by submarines. It's actually already out there in submarines. Um, do we think um, that we are ever going to get that in our smartphones, like we have GPS in our smartphone? Well, I wouldn't certainly say no. I mean, if, you can, if robins can have quantum effects in their brains, then surely human beings could one day make quantum effects work into something that could fit into your smartphone or into your pocket or whatever we have in smartphones in those days. And you, you can imagine that could be super useful. You, you, could have, uh, you could go into a supermarket, you could know exactly where you are, it could advise you about special offers or something like this. But also, if it can tell you that, it can also tell your um, service provider that, or you could tell Google that, or whoever you want. Um, so it comes into the kind of issues which are well known in, 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 in uh, the internet, for example, um, of uh, privacy. Who's going to have access to this data? Who's going to ha have access to this um, technology? And if you came to last week's talk in the series, you would have seen uh, that we already share vast amounts of data in our digital society, uh, and sometimes in ways that we're not even aware of. So this could add a whole new layer to those kind of uh, considerations. Uh, so um, I'd like just to finish by saying uh, we, we in the quantum technology, it's fantastic. It's really some of the best science in the world. And in Oxford, uh, we have some of the best quantum science in the world. Um, but to coin a phrase, it, that's not enough to have just the best science in the world. It's also important to have the best science for the world. So I'm going to leave you with uh, some links here, some useful uh, links uh, to, uh, to, uh, to some of the reports and so on. And, and I'd like to draw a potential 
I'd like to draw your attention, your attention particularly to the NKIT website, and there are links to a report that we've written on uh, the landscape of responsible innovation in quantum computing, and there's also a shorter version of that um, available as a policy brief. So thank you very much. I think we have a question and answer session now, don't we? We do this. Thank you very much. We um, have a few minutes for, for some questions, so microphones are here. If anybody would like to um, ask, comment, reflect. Yes, we have a hand up here on the right. Just a second for the microphone so the world can follow you. <laughs> well, my guess would be that the brain is microphone. a quantum com computer, and that's 80% water. And um, you raise the glass. You need to hold it up. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Now, yes. <laughs> yeah, so could the brain be using water? Because 80% of the brain is water uh, uh, for quantum computing. I mean, are water molecules possibly entangled? You know? I Which think, case there could I be think it's a fascinating question, actually, whether, whether our brain. Um, also uses uh, using, uses quantum mechanical um, effects, and and not just at the superficial level, you know, the structure of uh, molecules and so on, but maybe it even is important in our own thinking. And there there are many speculations out there. Um, I, I would say it's it's wide open. We we really find it very hard to do experiments at that level that would be conclusive enough. People have, for instance. Um, I looked at the way we perceive and identify objects. So you know you have a house, and if it's drawn in the usual way, uh, you, you can very quickly identify it as a house. And then the experiment tests how quickly you can tell it's a house as the image is rotating. And of course, it's much slower um, when it's upside down. It's much harder. It takes a bit longer for us to identify. And there are experiments like that where people are trying to model this. And some of these models, interestingly enough, are really quantum mechanical in origin. Uh, but, but to us physicists, this still only suggests that for some reason, this formalism happens to account for these simple effects, which doesn't really mean that ultimately you know, they are really genuinely quantum mechanical. But I think that's the next step. You know, it's, it's a really fascinating question. You've got me thinking, <laughs> <laughs> which good. is good. <laughs> Thank you. It was quite interesting that you put the algae, the uh, the algae in between the the two lights, sort of yes. in in the in the light pocket. Yes. And I just thought, do you think you could extrapolate from that experiment and take a bacteria, a colony, or a viral colony, and be able to? Instead of introducing the dye into it to be able to move the peak, et cetera, and say, yeah. is it alive or does it show a sign of life or, or not? Yes. To be able to test for antibacterial and antiviral properties. I think that's very a, quickly. Yeah? I have no idea, actually, is, is, is the quickest answer I can give you. But I think it, it, it's, it's an amazing question that you get asked immediately because that would yeah. be an, an obvious chemistry and biology application, actually. That. Because normally when you would test that, you'd have to wait, wouldn't that. you? You'd have to wait for quite Absolutely. a long time for the colony to grow. Yes. But if, if what you're saying if is you a real speed sign it up of life. For, yes, I agree. Yeah. I agree. So you can maybe shift the level to actually speed up the whole process yeah. and make it much more efficient. No one has done it. I think it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's go here, yeah. and then we'll come to front row and back row. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. Um, a number of distinguished speakers here in recent years have talked about um, uh, AI uh, as a, a way of replacing jobs. Yes. Um, and my question really is simply, would the advent of quantum computing in, in quantity really change the nature of work and the way we inhabit, it, inhabit the world? I can just talk, can't I? Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, I mean, I guess the thing is we don't, we don't necessarily know. I mean, it might be that quantum computing will be the breakthrough, which means that um, 
machine learning on that scale becomes possible. Although, I mean, I've seen some very convincing talks that describe, describe machine learning takeover, taking over a lot of jobs without any need for actually quantum. Mm. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's easy to say, oh, it's, it's the boring job that it'll take, but it won't just be the boring jobs. I mean, it'll be, it'll be some of the boring parts of uh, interesting jobs, like being a lawyer or being an accountant or something like that. So, I mean, um, you know, I, I think a lot, a lot of technologies have had quite um, catab well, cataclysmic, I don't know, huge changes, and not always good in the short term. You know, imagine when they, when they invented the spinning jenny and people were suddenly put out of work, you know. Uh, it, my guess is that it, my guess, really, is that it probably won't be quite like that because we've seen this kind of thing before and we can kind of prepare for it. But if it happens very quickly, you know, maybe it won't be like that, yeah. Yeah, I think it's the time scales are, are definitely uncertain, just to echo yeah. what you said. We, you know, it could happen in five years' time if the right technology comes up. Uh, it could take longer than that, but I think most people would agree that it's inevitable now. So that gives us a little bit of time, certainly, to adjust uh, to these kind of questions. But, but it's probably a more generic question that goes beyond quantum computation, because the trend is already there, and I think it will happen with or without quantum computers. Yes. Um, my question relates not to the, the last question, but the one before, really, uh, as to what could be uh, detected using quantum systems. And I was wondering maybe if you could say something beyond just uh, viruses or, or that, but could um, life itself be detected using uh, yes. that method? Because I, you, you mentioned that um, perhaps just about any molecule could be used uh, for quantum computing. Yeah. Um, is there any difference in the quantum mechanical effects from the bacteria if they were alive or dead? I mean, if you if you if you kill them first and put them in, will you get exactly the same effects or it's not? A, it's a great question, actually. It's, it's absolutely, it's a spot on question, actually. It's, um, th there are many aspects. I'm just, I'm just gonna try to be brief. The experiment that Dave Coles did, there's absolutely no difference, really, um, whether they're dead or alive, because the molecules that are responsible for absorbing light would still be doing that even if they died for a while. So basically, you could show the same. The, the amazing thing here is that, is that observing them and, and testing quantum effects doesn't negatively interfere with them being alive, which is why I'm saying they're alive. But actually, <clears throat> if you took the molecules out, uh, the photosynthetic ones, and just probed them independently from the bacteria, you would get the same kind of quantum mechanical effect, absolutely. But I think where your question was going, in, 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 it, it was going in a much more exciting and fundamental direction, which is actually, does even the existence of life depend on quantum mechanics? Maybe you wouldn't have uh, life um, the way we know it, or maybe life could not even evolve if the universe was, was really not quantum mechanical. I'd love that to be the case, because I hear lots of people saying biology is more fundamental than physics, you know? So first of all, we physicists had to evolve, and then we can do physics, you know? So biology <laughs> comes prior. But if I could show that quantum physics is crucial for the existence of life, that would be great, you know? At least it would be an equalizer, if you know what I mean. So basically, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. What's unclear at all is how to test this, how to do this really in the lab. What kind of experiments would I have to really undertake to show that something could not happen if I, if I prohibit quantum mechanical effects? But, I, but it's a great question. A last one, or are we at the limits? I was just struck by your, your remark because maybe part of tonight's um, presentations also speaks to something that is not uh, in a chronological sense evolutionary, but maybe more in the ecological sense yes. that we create balance. So maybe you need to coexist between biology and physics, but also between the frontiers of science and the frontiers of human judgment, and yes. you know whether it is in employment and in other terms. and. I must say, um, you know, the, the lecture series is sort of um, uh, focused on uh, 
frontier thinking. And I think tonight, uh, Vladko, and Philip, also to you, thank you so much for, um, well, first of all, having taken us forward in terms of the frontiers of imagination. Certainly for me, I said to Vladko, certainly for me, this is the most fascinating lecture in physics I've ever attended. Um, <laughs> But I was also looking at the first row here, and I'm not quite sure whether this is already, um, you know, uh, disciples of yours, or... Um, I, I really I, hope so. I for really those hope you so. can see, this is our youngest participant that I've seen in the lecture Absolutely. series. And he's been cracking some of your dilemmas. Leo is great. <laughs> I'm hoping, what we need to do is, we need to, I'm going to be very technical for one second now. We need someone to superpose uh, an object of the size of the Planck mass, that's about a millionth of a gram, at two places across a meter. And if you could do that, that would be amazing. Okay, that would just, just, you know, it would take probably 20 years and I'm hoping one of these young guys will do that. And that's the route into quantum gravity. That would already be showing somehow that gravity is also quantum mechanical. So I think this bridge between micro and macro, um, I think the young guys are definitely required to do that, yeah. Well, don't age too soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you for a fascinating glimpse into, into the world of quantum computing and what lies ahead. And, and Philip, to you also for bringing some of the work of, of the center, that uh, the human-centered computing part of computer science that is, is very much, I think, in the philosophy of the university and also of the kind of conversations we believe we have to have here. And uh, to you, Vladko, also thank you with your team for the leadership you have shown Thanks in this wonderful much. program. May the frontiers be broken very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good night, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.